Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Curriculum and Instruction Committee for Thursday, April 15th, 2021. In accordance with the mandated direction of the state superintendent, Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are closed to the public and non-essential personnel in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's resolution approved at the March 10th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream and on the BCPS website or on BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Cox, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Sure. Ms. Pastor? Present. Mr. Offerman? Present. Dr. Hager? Present. Ms. Mack? Present. Mr. Mahamza? Okay. All righty, thank you. Uh, Ms. Cox, uh, will you call the names of all staff members participating in today's meeting? Dr. McComas? Present. Dr. Adams? Present. Ms. Shea? Present. Dr. Wistead? Present. Dr. Perandosi? Present. We have Ms. Kraft. Present. And Ms. Wicks. She'll be joining okay. us for the second part for the writing okay. presentation. Okay. All right. And that's all I have. All right. And um, Ms. Katz, are there any other board members or anyone else participating on the call that you have not named? Nope, I haven't. No one else. All right, I thank you. All right, with that having been done, a welcome to all of you for our um, uh, curriculum committee meeting. And uh, we are going to start. Uh, Ms. Um, uh, Dr. McComas, do you want to um, open with your agenda? Item. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Pasture and members of the committee. I do um, want to ask um, permission if we could add an agenda item. I did not, um, I should have realized this last week, but I did not, so I totally um, take ownership of that. We have a few um, curriculum phase forms that we were bringing forward. We'd like approval so that we can have these um, in good order for the summer learning program. One in particular is connected to our brand new Bridge to Kindergarten summer program that um, we were starting this year um, in response to the pandemic and as part of a grant from the state of Maryland. So um, I'd like to ask if I could add that as the first agenda item since it's an approval item and Ms. Shea would be speaking to each of the, the phase forms that we're requesting approval for. And of course, I would go back and make sure all those things got added to the board docs. All right, Ms. Thanks. Pastor, do you need a motion? 
I do. Um, uh, Ms. Mack, would you like to make that motion, please? I move to add to the agenda the um, curriculum Eight. items that Dr. McComas just outlined for curriculum committee review and approval. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Do I have second a second? Offering. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. All right, we are set and I'm going to turn it over to you uh, first, Dr. McComas, to make any introductions or to get us started. Yes, ma'am. First, I'd just like to thank all the members of the committee uh, because I do my best to try and make sure that we always have things ahead of time, so I do apologize. Um, what you have in front of you or what Ms. Shea is about to speak to you is every year we bring forward what we call air phase forms, and that's really identifying new courses or changes to courses or courses that are being terminated uh, that we work uh, to establish course numbers with the Maryland State Department of Education. We do this uh, annually. Dr. McComas, excuse me. Is yes, there any possibility that this can be enlarged a, a bit? Yes, ma'am. Thank Ms. Shea, you. Can you? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Uh -huh. And um, just so that the committee knows and all stakeholders who are maybe joining us today through broadcast, we do this annually. We will next month in May bring what is our changes going into next school year. These items today, we did not want to wait another month because we needed to seek approval to be um, ready for summer learning. So at that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Shea, who will walk us through what we're requesting permission for. Thank, Thank you. you. I apologize. Can you still see the screen? I couldn't uh, unmute for a moment. No, absolutely not. OK, that's better. Thank you. Uh, OK, okay. Thank, you Thank you so you. Sure. Um, so good afternoon, members of the committee. Thank you so much for letting me add this. Um, as, as Dr. McComas said, you're familiar with this process already. We come every year to talk about new courses, but today I'm here. I'll be back again in May with our newest courses for the 22-23 school year, um, but this is to allow us to build a course in the scheduling system to support our summer programming. So the first course that you see listed there is for early childhood. We were able to utilize a grant for this summer, as part of the response to the pandemic, we did apply for and receive a grant to develop a bridge to kindergarten summer program. Um, you will hear more information about that in a more detailed summer program presentation, um, but we're very excited to be able to support the recovery efforts um, for pre-K students attending Title I schools. So this will allow them to have a four-week program to participate in literacy, math, and social emotional supports to have a more successful bridge into kindergarten. Um, and so by granting us this permission, we'll be able to build that course now so that we can enroll our students for this summer. The second one um, actually has come up to this committee before, but it was put on pause. So um, we are adding for our elementary ESOL offerings at the elementary school. We know that one of the populations that we serve in the elementary school are actually heritage and native Spanish speaking students. So we have a number of our early childhood students in the elementary level who come to us as ESOL um, students who are native heritage Spanish speakers. And what we're trying to do here is, um, as you know in this committee, and we'll be talking tonight a lot about literacy, it's really important that for our youngest learners, as we're seeking to teach them English, we're also continuing to develop their literacy in their native language. So the intent of this course is that we will have a summer offering that is dual immersion. And so this will allow us to continue to develop their literacy in Spanish while also offering opportunity for them to develop English. So we're really excited about that. We did discuss this last year, you may recall, uh, when we were talking, we had a longer presentation around ESOL, um, but then it was put on pause last year based on the closures for coronavirus. So we are um, asking permission to move forward with that this summer. And then the third one, this is not a new program, um, but it is we do need to create a new course number so that for the purposes of scheduling and enrolling students, we have accurate information. So you know that in our special education programs, we offer um, our students an opportunity for extended school year known as ESY. Um, and this is for middle school students who receive services outside the general education 
um, setting, but not in a regional program. So they receive services at their home middle school during extended school year. Um, we previously, th again, this is not a new program offering, um, but this would enable us to actually offer a separate course. So we're seeking permission to build these three courses right now. Um, Ms. Pesher, I know you mentioned making it larger. I will submit. Um, Ms. Cox has um, for your review, and I know Dr. McComas mentioned for board docs, um, a chart that outlines this. Um, the other courses that you'll Thank see you. reflect. Oh, excuse me. Sure. Um, the other courses that you'll see reflected on that chart are not new. We did talk about them previously, but I wanted to pull them back here because they were also put on pause. Um, you'll remember our Academy of Health Professions. We had uh, multiple presentations around our dental assistant program and our physical rehabilitation program. Um, we had talked about that in detail as well as our music and audio technology and science courses. Um, I did put them back on this chart because they are the courses that will be in place for 21-22. In May when I come back, I'll be talking specifically about new courses for the 22-23 school year. Um, but the three new ones that Dr. McComas described that we need for summer are reflected here on this first slide. So with that, I will thank you for letting me slide this in this evening so that the team uh, pending your approval can get, buildy, build, get busy building so we can begin to enroll our students. And I'm and happy Ms. to take any questions. Thank Ms. you. Ms. just to be um, clear, it's the first three that we're seeking approval on this evening. Is that right. correct? Correct. The others okay. have already been approved, but are going to be a part of the spring offering. So I just included them on the same chart as a reminder. OK, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to go around. I'll start with Mr. Offerman and then um, Ms. Mack. Mr. Offerman, if you have any questions. No. Thank you, Ms. Mack. I have a question about the second um, <clears throat> second uh, course. Sure. My question yeah. is, what is the age? Is the ES just, <clears throat> excuse me, elementary school? Elementary and is school. it mm -hmm. is it K through five or? It could be. So it's offered at the elementary level based on the proficiency levels for ESOL. So it could be a range. One school might have first and second graders. Others might enroll third. So it's really open for any of the elementary grades. So are we looking at the, the student body of each school saying this school has a high percentage of Spanish speaking students and therefore we're going to do this here as opposed to something else somewhere else. Exactly. So I can actually uh, submit when we send the chart the specific schools where we'll be offering this summer unless Dr. Wisted might have that list in front of her, but if not I can make sure to get it for you. But that's exactly the process we use for identifying those sites and I know that will also be included as part of the summer programs. Um, presentation that you'll get, I believe, in May or June. My other question is this. In the Southwest area, we have a very high population of Burmese speaking mm -hmm. students. Um, will we be expanding offerings such as this for summer programs for um, other languages in which we have a high population of students? It's a great question, Ms. Mack. I know that the idea of dual immersion is definitely something that we're interested in pursuing. Of course, with um, the population of Burmese students, it would require us to also have staff um, that that spoke um, Burmese and that were able to support that. Um, so it's definitely something that we are talking about around immersion and we would follow the same pathway about thinking about those areas where we had a high density population that needed that. Um, and as a team, the Office of World Languages is really, and ESOL, work very closely together now under one director, um, Ms. Hernandez, because we know that especially for our elementary students, but really for all of our students, we have to continue to develop both literacy. So I can certainly share that it is on the horizon. Um, right now, Spanish, as you've mentioned, is by far and away our primary language system wide. So it's where we're beginning this idea of dual immersion. So then my last question very quickly is when I came to the board, I was very surprised to know that ESOL teachers didn't speak all the languages for mm -hmm. which they provided services, but this is different. Am I correct in saying this you is different correct. and the, the people involved in this will actually speak the language? Both. Correct. You are correct. Okay. That is the difference between an immersion course and a traditional ESOL. In a traditional ESOL course, they do not. Sometimes they do. Sometimes we're lucky and they have that ability, but because we serve students, I think at last count we were up to maybe 106 different languages. Um, we do not have staff that speak all of the languages, and we oftentimes have students combined in classes that speak many different languages. In this particular program, because the focus is immersion, the teacher will be native or 
fluent in both Spanish and English, and the instruction will take place in both. Thank you very much. You got it. I believe the two schools we're doing this is Colgate and Baltimore Highlands, but I'm going to double check for you and follow up. Oh, great. Thank you. I love sure Baltimore thing. Highlands. Yeah, me too. I, have, I love Colgate too. <laughs> I have a question about the first one, Bridge yes, to Kindergarten. Sir. All right, so this program is designed for uh, students who are in Title I schools to try to close some gaps. Is that correct? That is correct. correct. It's for students who are currently enrolled in pre-K in our Title I schools, which is primarily where we have our pre-K programs. Right. OK, um, so my question is this, uh, just the nature of the program. Uh, what are the possibilities that any of the things that are a part of this program uh, can be shared with children who might have some of the same problems but are not necessarily in a Title I school. Do we have any ability or leeway where we see some real significant need to just share it? And I'm not talking in the same numbers as sure. in those Title I but schools, but where we might see a principal or someone might identify a child somewhere who might do well with this program. Ms. Pesture, I can take that. This is Melissa Wistead. So we right. applied um, through MSDE for the grant and the way we wrote the grant was the Title I schools only. So we would not have any flexibility this summer because that's the way we wrote the grant that was approved. Okay, uh, then. Can I piggyback on that, Dr. Yeah, Wistead? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Ms. Pesture. I apologize. Now, I, well, that being said, um, is there anything that's even remotely comparable um, for students who are not in a Title I? So, right, so uh, go ahead, oh, Dr. Wister. Oh, I was just going to say, so this is a face-to-face -face program. That's the grant opportunity. We do, we will have um, a digital, you know, summer learning hike like we did last summer, but it is, uh, this is the only face-to-face -face program for that pre-K aged student unless they qualified for ESY um, through their IEP process, you know, through special education. But One of Mary, the other, and that the other is what I is, wanted to hear if that they some of our students will then qualify because that will could well be asked of us. They will qualify under um, the other two or if they have an the other one or if they have an IEP. Yes, correct. OK, thank you. Yes, go ahead, Dr. Mary. Did you have something more? Oh no, go ahead. We can we can go on because I want I know Miss Mack put in the that she had another question as well about this one. So I, I'll, I'll you covered Dr. it. I think Dr. Hager should go. Oh, okay. Thank you. I I didn't see that. Realize. Let me open up my chat. Thank no, you. I don't. I have have she has a question, but she should have an opportunity. Right. Oh. I, I I'm on it. I've got it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right, everybody. Too many yeah, chefs too in the kitchen. Chairs, right, and that's not where I'm today. So, Dr. Hager, would you like to ask your question? Uh, I just have one small question. I think these all sound wonderful. Um, for the special education um, uh, course, um, will this require additional teachers? Uh, because we'll, they'll be doing it at the home schools. And um, if so, do you see this as a barrier to implementing it in every school? Or is this something that you already have uh, the logistics? Um, sorted out. This is Melissa with said again. Um, yes, we already have it planned out. So, um, so typically during the school year, students who have outside general education services are are served at their home school. Many years ago, we used to um, separate it out and kind of regionalize that group of students as well for the summer. But this summer, we do not want to do that, which is why we need a new course number for it so that the students say they go to Middle River Middle during the school year, they qualify for extended school year, they will attend Middle River Middle um, in the summer as well if we have this course. So yes, we already have the staffing planned and it's just seamless for um, the students. Great, thank you. Sounds sure. right. Dr. Hager, Ms. Mack. My follow up question, actually, it's not a follow up question, but to the bridge to kindergarten, because for many of these kids, this is really their first foray, if you will, into school. 
what steps are we taking to ensure that we are not cramming like pure academics down their throats to, to turn them off from school? Like what, what are we sure. doing to make it so that they want to come back and they want to participate? So, um, so it could be that some of these students were in pre-K this school year. That that would be the group of students who are qualifying for the summer. Um, perhaps they did not choose to participate face to face, even in these, you know, last few weeks and, and for the remaining weeks of school. But um, I just wanted to clarify that for you. That it oh, thank is, you. Thank yeah, you. It, it's for the students who are currently um, enrolled. And as far as what the specific uh, curriculum is, you know, with any, uh, we're, we'll be setting that up um, with the early childhood office and giving like a, a suggested guide as to what will happen in the hours that the students are there. But it is a blend of um, social emotional learning and academic, um, you know, skill based items. If, if that's what you're asking about. Well, and I was just going to add, whenever we design the summer programs, Miss Mack, we we always do so with the lens that it is the summer and kids have a lot of competing things that they want to be doing in the summer and we want to make sure that it's really fun, highly engaging and provides a really positive experience so that they have that opportunity to have that additional learning time, but it feels like a positive um, opportunity and experience. So I think you were also asking about making sure that they fall in love with school, which is really right. the job of early childhood education. Right. And, and this is just, optional. Is that correct? And we cannot make kids do this? Correct. correct. It is all optional. Parent um, selected. Right. Thank and you. I would just say, Miss Mack, just for everyone, you know, it's early childhood. So developmentally, the pedagogy is designed to be very active and very engaging and appropriate for children of that age around their attention span and um, and they're, they're the best method of learning for little ones. So I just want to assure okay. you of that as well. Thank you. We're not, okay. we're not drilling and killing our math facts. <laughs> that, that's exactly what I wanted you to say. Thank you. Yes, All right. Thank pleasure. you. Thank you. Let's move on here. So I'm going to ask this question of the membership. Um, do either of you, any of you, is Mr. Mahomza on yet? No? Okay. Of the three um, members other than myself on here, uh, any of you have a problem with doing these three new ones as a group for the sake of time versus one at a time? Is there a problem from anyone? Please speak up. I have no problem. Thank you. Dr. Hager, any problem? No problem at all. Thank you, Mr. Um, Offerman. None at all. Thank you. Then I'd like to have a motion, please, to accept these three new programs from uh, the grants for this summer. I so move, move Offerman. Thank you, Mr. Mack. Offerman. Thank you, Ms. Mack, for making that second. Thank you. All right, Ms. Uh, Dr. McComas, we can move on. Thank you. We have to do a roll call. Okay. <laughs> All righty. Thank you. Um, did I just do, I, I think I do this every one of these meetings. I get a motion and a second and move on. All right. Uh, Ms. Mack? Yes. Uh, Mr. Offerman? Yes. Uh, Dr. Hager? Yes. And Ms. Cox, since I took your job, I'm going to let you call my name. <laughs> Ms. Pastor? Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> now we move on. I'm just trying to move this forward. We have a lot thank to do. Thank you very do. much. All righty, thank you. Continue, Dr. McComas, with the oh, next. Yes, ma'am. And again, thank you, members of the committee, for that opportunity. Um, our present, our next presentation today is our Ready to Read Act, uh, which was um, moved from our last presentation, our last meeting. We did, we ran out of time, so we're back today. Um, and at that, I'm going to turn it over to Miss Shea and her team, Miss Kraft and uh, Dr. Wolf, and uh, let them take it away. So, thank you. Unmuted. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. McComas, and thank you for this opportunity, members of the committee. I am joined here today by Ms. Kraft, our Director of ELA, and Ms. Pam Wolf, actually Dr. Pam Wolf, Coordinator of Office of ELA. 
Um, and we are here to talk about, I know we've had several questions from members of the committee and the community um, to talk about the specifics of the Ready to Read Act. Um, I also will offer, um, we were very fortunate on Monday evening to have time with the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee or CCAC to also share some of this information. So we appreciate the time. Next slide, Mr. Corns. Thank you. So as many of you already know, the Ready Re to Read Act began as a Senate bill really specifically identifying the need for us to ensure that we are providing early screening and intervention model for students um, in danger of reading difficulty. We know that the research is clear that the earlier we can intervene on behalf of our students, uh, we can avoid so many of the struggles that we hear from students and families with the very important opportunity of learning to read. And so the legislation provides for multiple steps. It includes an opportunity for us to be required to do a screening. Um, and we're going to talk more about those specifics of what's entailed in that screening as measured by the evidence based tools that we use. It also has a requirement that pending the results of the screening, we have to act. We have to do in some cases further screening or diagnostics as well as offer supplemental instruction. And then we do have a responsibility to monitor the student's progress once we have put them in some type of supplemental instruction. Um, and so if you can advance to the next slide, Mr. Corns. Specifically, the legislation identifies that all kindergarten students need to be screened. It also identifies that any first grade student who was not screened in kindergarten or who was continuing to demonstrate difficulty with mastering grade level reading in kindergarten. So if by the third time or spring of kindergarten that screening indicates that they have not yet met benchmark, then the expectation is that we would continue screening them in the first grade. It also expects that we are screening any student in grades one through five who is new to our school system, unless it, the student is coming to us from perhaps another jurisdiction in Maryland and already has a screening um, information and that that screening doesn't demonstrate that they have evidence of difficulty. So we are responsible for doing it for all students um, that are new to the system. And then the last requirement is around students with an IEP. In many cases, the team, um, the process of developing the IEP has already included multiple diagnostic evaluations that may or may not have already determined the need for supplemental reading instruction. Um, and in that case, we don't want to um, administer any additional assessments that aren't going to give us any new information. However, not every student who is currently being served with an individualized education plan has been um, screened or had those diagnostic evaluations. So we also want to make sure that we're not missing the opportunity. Um, so any student that has an IEP, this is really a collaborative effort. So the directions are for schools to work together, perhaps the special educators along with reading specialists um, or the administrative team to make a determination about whether that student, um, whether we have the appropriate diagnostic evaluation information or whether we need to screen the child. So that is the um, expectations as outlined in the legislation of who needs to be screened. Um, if you advance to the next slide, please, Mr. Corns. In BCPS, we do meet the terms of the legislation by screening all kindergarten students three times a year, but we actually screen all first grade students three times a year as well. Um, when adopting this legislation, one thing that's important to note, and I know that you've heard us present on this um, in the past and certainly in partnership with um, CCAC and with our um, other stakeholders, um, we actually in Baltimore County have been doing screening for quite some time. We weren't necessarily doing it for all students the way that it's outlined, but this is something that's been in place in Baltimore County for quite some time. And in fact, we had an opportunity to share our success with screening um, with uh, levels of the state as they were working towards this legislation. So that's something I just want to share that we're proud of. Um, but to that end, we found that with the number of students we have that might transition between schools in first grade or that may they enter at multiple points in the year, we wanted to make sure that we had a much more um, broad approach to screening. And so our expectation in BCPS is that we screen all kindergarten students and all first grade students three times a year. And then we certainly have that additional um, screening expectation for either new students or students with an IEP for whom we don't feel we have enough diagnostic information. Next slide. 
So we've talked about who we screen, and now I want to just take a moment to talk about what screener we're using. Um, so you may have heard us talk about a screening assessment called DIBBLES. DIBBLES is an acronym. We love our acronyms in education. Um, it stands for Dynamic Indicators of Basic Early Literacy Skills. Uh, we actually use the eighth edition and is um, a tool that a screening tool that was developed and published through the University of Oregon. It is a screener, so you see there the reference to sort of a temperature check. Um, it is brief. Our, um, we're going to talk a little bit more about what it measures, but the Dibble screener, um, each individual measure is very brief, um, one minute. Uh, we know that it has validity, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and we use it as a measurement to identify or predict whether students may be at risk. So that is important to understand the predictive validity, but also the idea that they may be at risk. Um, so it is not unlike when the warning light in your car goes off. Um, so it's an opportunity for us to do a quick screener to see which students may be at risk, and then we'll talk about how what comes with it then are some next steps. When the task force that was developing this recommendation that ultimately led to the legislation known as the Ready to Read Act, one of the things that they really were um, very focused on was making sure that school systems were picking screeners that measured all of the critical skills necessary. And so they identified specific skills that would be required to be measured. Um, and Dibbles is a screener that does meet that expectation because it measures the critical skills necessary for reading success in future grades. The other thing that's important to understand is this idea of the D standing for dynamic. So on the Dibble screeners, they identified benchmark goals that are criterion referenced and that have been used over time to determine the level necessary for predicting reading success in the future. But those benchmark goals are dynamic, meaning that they change and grow over time, depending on when the assessment is being administered. And so the level that we would expect a student to be performing in the fall, winter and spring will grow and change as reflective of the progress that we want readers to be making in fall, winter and spring to be sure that they are on that trajectory for reading success in the future. And then last, I mentioned that we are using the Dibble's 8th edition um, and it has been proven as having validity as a dyslexia screener. So many of our students um, have a, a wide variety of challenges as they're striving as readers, but we know in particular that we have a lot of stakeholders very interested in making sure that we're screening our students and flagging them for potential difficulty um, based on dyslexia. And so only some screeners do the correct screening of those critical skills that would offer validity as a screener for dyslexia in particular, um, and Dibbles is one, which is part of why we selected it. Next slide, please. And so with that, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Wolf. Hopefully she was able to join and can be heard. I am here. Can you hear Wonderful. me? Wonderful. Welcome, you. Dr. Wolf. Thank you, Shay. Um, Good afternoon, board members. Um, so this slide is actually breaking down and sharing what actual um, parts of component skills of reading that are measured through Dibbles. So you can see on the left hand side, those are the big ideas of reading that were defined by the National Reading Panel. Um, and these are those components that are really critical skills to proficient reading. Um, as, as Ms. Shea said, each subtest takes one minute. So they're a really quick way for teachers without, a, there's minimal disruptions to classroom instruction. Um, the first big idea of reading is phonemic awareness, which is that ability to hear and manipulate sounds and spoken words and understand that spoken words and syllables are made up of a sequence of speech sounds. Um, the phoneme segmentation fluency task is an oral task. So it's, it measures the student's ability to break apart a word into the individual phonemes. For example, if the examiner were to say cat, the student would say cat or chop would be ch up. This is one of the strongest predictors for children who experience early reading success. And um, it's also one of the subtests that is part of that dyslexia screening as well. Additional subtests measure the alphabetic principle, and this is the ability to associate those sounds with the letters um, and put those sounds at letters together to actually read and decode words. So there are two subtests that do this and that's the nonsense word fluency. And I'm gonna show you an example of that on the next slide. But nonsense words really determine how well a student uses their phonic skills to decode those unknown words. 
CVC, consonant, vowel, consonant words, um, and that they're not reading from memory, that they actually have to apply their phonics skills, decoding skills. Um, that subtest is actually scored in two ways. First, if the students give the correct letter sounds, but then also if they can blend and read the whole word correctly. Another alphabetic principle or decoding subtest is word reading fluency. Um, and this is actually, this is a new one to Dibble's eighth edition, and this is having students read sight words out of context. So words like the, was, of, in, no, we, um, that's an opportunity for teachers, for um, teachers to assess if students know the, those real, those high frequency or sight words as well. Oral reading fluency is a subtest that begins in grade one, the beginning of first grade, and oral reading fluency is connected text, and students are asked to read it um, a time for a minute and the teachers count up the number of words that are read accurately. So you're looking for accuracy, but you're also looking for that automaticity or fluency in reading. Finally, the last subtest is letter naming fluency. Um, children's knowledge of letter names and shapes is a strong predictor of success in learning to read. Knowing letter names is actually very strongly related to the children's ability to remember the forms of written words and their ability to treat words as sequences of letters. It's also going to support writing when the writing time comes. Next slide, please. On this slide, you actually see a sample of two of the subtests. This is the letter naming fluency assessment, and you can see it's made up of both upper and lower case letters, and it's administered to kindergarten and first grade during all three, first graders during all three assessment periods. So it's the beginning, middle, and end of the year. And we're looking for an accurate, but also a rapid naming of the letters, for the, which is a really important skill again for early reading success. The second subtest is there's an example of the nonsense word fluency to measure students decoding. Nonsense words really um, ensure that students, again, are not reading from memory. So you can see students are given one line at a time and they can either respond t, I, b, or tib. If they read it as tib, they get correct letter sound and words read correctly. So that's what we're looking for as we move through first grade for increasing the number of words read correctly. Next slide, please. So after we give the screening, what we the, those results then, as Ms. Shea had shared, are on a continuum or benchmark. So a benchmark score is given for each of the subtests at each point in the year, and it determines whether the student is meeting those goals or are they intensive um, or low strategic, meaning that we would need to provide a deeper dive into really analyzing if there is a reading difficulty where we would would um, administer a diagnostic assessment. Just as if that thermometer shares that you have a fever, we don't know what might be the reason for that fever, so we want to do a little bit more assessments to figure out, is it phonemic awareness, is it phonics, what might be one of the struggling areas for a student? Um, where do they need more support and instruction? Another piece of after that screener, then we also can begin to target right away um, wh what supplemental reading instruction does that student need? So if a student's not scoring benchmark and they're in that strategic area, what the research shows is that child needs time in addition to the core in small group for support in that area of reading that's critical for success. Um, intensive students need more time and maybe even a smaller group um, so we can bring them up to benchmark. Next slide, please. And this is an example of what we're using because we have such a strong research based core in open court foundational skills in K to three. There is actually built in to open court a supplemental or small group instruction. For each lesson in open court. So what it's saying is that in addition to that core every day, there's a lesson that's already developed for teachers to provide that small group targeted inter in intervention or instruction. This is so phenomenal, but because we also know that the best intervention and support for a striving reader is more and less in a group so I can get more direct feedback, not something different. So we're really being able to intensify the strong core instruction with the supplemental instruction. 
if we're progress monitoring and seeing that student still is not making success or meeting the the, the um, benchmark goals, then we have the intervention framework, which we've been lucky to share with you at a previous board meeting that we get the students then and reading specialists, literacy teams can work together to determine if the student needs something more or something different and with an intervention. Next slide, please. And then at the at, with the, for the Ready to Read Act, each year we will report to Maryland State Department of Education these four criteria, the number of students in each grade level and the number of students that were screened, the students that were identified as at risk at the beginning of the year, and then the number of students who received supplemental reading instruction. So you can see we're putting together a very strong early support um, program, really a um, framework for our earliest readers so they're successful in kindergarten and first grade. Next slide, please. And I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Kraft. All right, good afternoon, everyone. So we're going to take a minute and look at um, our data from the beginning of the year to mid-year. Um, and I want to start with talking about the fact that um, the Dibbles norms, so what is used to create these cutoffs, are based on face-to-face -face administration and not virtual. And so we just want to acknowledge up front as we begin to look at this data that we did not administer how it was normed, right? Because we're still um, administering in virtual. Um, and so therefore, since Dibbles is a timed assessment, the lag of virtual administration could have impacted the results. Um, so what you see here are uh, composite scores, and the composite scores are a combination of multiple Dibble subtest scores, which provides the best overall estimate of the student's reading proficiency. So the new composite score in the Dibbles 8th edition is the most robust predictor of risk that Dibbles has ever offered, and that's according to them based on all their research studies. Um, it's superior to looking at any one subtest um, in terms of reliability and predictability and looking at predictors. So each benchmark subtest has two cut scores. Um, students scoring below um, the risk cut score um, at, of not meeting end of year reading expectations. And then those students that re, um, are on track to meet the end of the year expectations. And so that's what you see in front of you is um, those two. The middle one, I want to talk about strategic. So core benchmark are our students that are on track. We believe that they are going to hit their reading targets by the end of the year. Um, the second category, um, is strategic. These are students that they are not low enough to really be marked as intensive. Um, those students that need intensive intervention to meet the goal by the end of the year. The strategic, if a child scores in the strategic range, it's very likely that the classroom uh, instruction will not be enough. So that tier one instruction won't be enough, um, but that the teacher will have to provide some differentiated or strategic instruction in addition to the core. They are not quite at the level of needing an intensive intervention, however. Uh, next slide. Um, so as you're looking at the numbers, the other thing that we want to talk about is, you know, as we look at this data at the central office level, if we start to see a school that um, misinterpreted the guidelines, because remember, Dibbles is not new this year. The legislation is new, but we've been using Dibbles for years. And so in the past, we did not um, have everybody screen kindergarten and first grade three times a year. And so what we saw this year, even though we provided professional development, is that there was some uneven um, our, uh, beginnings to this in terms of making sure that all of our students are screened. So as you look at some of the numbers, you might have in your head been wondering about that. So we have been working with schools, we have been helping them understand who needs to be screened and when. Um, and we will continue to provide that professional learning throughout the remainder of this year and as we go into next year. Um, so as you see across the top of this chart, it's the specific breakdown of the composite score that I showed you on the previous slide. Um, and so we start with letter naming fluency, um, and then I, and I know that Dr. Wolf just went through all these, but just so um, because it's the acronym, letter naming fluency, the phoneme segmentation fluency, nonsense word fluency, uh, words read 
correctly, and then finally words read fluently. And so this is what you'll see for our kindergartners, and you'll see again those categories that we talked about, students that are on track, all they need is the core instruction. Students that are going to need some differentiated instruction is that yellow line, and our students that are in need of some intensive intervention is um, the red line. Uh, next slide. So this is um, the same breakdown of categories with a couple additional in first grade um, that uh, again is a breakdown from that composite score down to the individual subtest scores for our first grade students. And so you'll see the same ones I just talked about. And then in first grade, we also have the oral reading fluency for words correct and oral reading fluency for accuracy. And so again, you can see um, where our students are falling. Our students that are in falling in that intensive category are going to need supplemental instruction in order to meet grade level goals by the end of the year. Next slide. And Dr. Wolf is gonna come in and tell us what we've learned so far. So the, this slide and the next slide actually go together. So what we did on this slide is we sort of summarized the data analysis and implications. So what we when we're looking at the data, one of the things we can use open court for is to really look at the fidelity of open court instruction for all students. So what it's revealed to us is that we are going to do much more targeted professional learning. We've already started that this year. Um, resource teachers are supporting and doing coaching one to one with schools to really make sure that those instructional routines within open court are being um, implemented and that all more of our all of our students are meeting with success and then how to differentiate within the classroom. Um, another curriculum implication is that when we look at the data, kindergarten open court scope and sequence focuses on letter names and formation of handwriting for the first five units. So it really is in unit six that they we shift to that phonemic awareness and isolating the individual sound. They've done a lot of phonological activities up to now, like clapping syllables and listening for a number of words in a sentence. But now instruction shifts to really pinpoint that phoneme segmentation fluency. So when we look at our data and phoneme segmentation fluency in kindergarten, we're not seeing it as strong and it's not because it's not reflected necessarily in the kindergarten curriculum at this point. I mean, we've consulted with Open Court to confirm that across the country. Um, we're expecting schools that really implement Open Court with Fidelity to see a real strong growth in phoneme segmentation fluency by the end of the year. Um, and it's also phonemic awareness is a little bit more difficult to do. Um, virtually, as Ms. Shea shared earlier, there's a lag. I want to give corrective feedback. I need to listen to everybody, and it's harder when we're, we're, we're in an online setting. It's much easier to instruct um, when I'm face to face, but we've also recommended to teachers through this year is that most of that phoneme instruction should be provided in small groups for that reason. Next slide, please. So what some of the things, this slide really begins to summarize for you what we're doing this year is to support um, open court implementation. We've provided some PD for our principals and assistant principals, and we're actually getting to ready to plan another one for May for setting up the year for success with open court and how uh, building administrators can also monitor and really support planning and instruction with the fidelity that we've talked about. Um, we've been providing support to classroom teachers. We've had some professional learning opportunities and then we are doing the coaching by our resource teachers. Next year we're going to make sure that all teachers have support in open court from the beginning of the year through the year through sessions we're going to be able to offer. All new teachers have been given after school sessions and we've had actually the highest attendance we've ever had for new teacher um, new teacher learning sessions after school. I, we think the virtual may be helping that but also the topic of open court is always one that draws an audience. Um, and then with our reading specialists, we've been addressing open court and phonics instruction in each of the monthly meetings, along with Dibble's data analysis to really make sure we're providing our reading specialists with the tools and skills that they can be that literacy leader and support at each school and with each teacher. And um, we've been analyzing Dibble's to really support 
how teachers and reading specialists can support that use of data for instructional grouping and small group targeted instruction. The Dibbles website actually offers an opportunity. It, it helps teachers actually, it does it automatically based on how they score and provides suggestions for what that target skill should be. And we've really been um, using that data to also, as I stated earlier, to monitor and improve the fidelity of how OpenCourt is implemented. Next slide, please. Oh, it looks like that. And I think this is Ms. Kraft. Um, so I can do it, Dr. Wolf, but I'm coming in on the MTSS slide. Would you like oh, me I'm to sorry. talk about no, this one? No, this is still me. I'm sorry. Yeah. I apologize. <laughs> I'm happy to do it, though. Um, we've been really, really fortunate this year to have so much a great, um, we have have a really great co collaboration with McGraw-Hill and they've been doing a lot of PD for us at the district level of how to use their remote digital resources, as you can see in the left hand corner of the screen, for really um, um, effective instruction in the virtual environment to the best of the ability that we can really use that. We've also visited several third grade classrooms in Google Meets to see Open Court in action. And it's so great to see how teachers have adapted the dictation routine for virtual instruction. Students were completing um, using digital tools. Teachers were using GoGuardian to monitor and provide that immediate feedback, ensuring that all students were engaged in the learning. And we've seen teachers really increase their efficacy of teaching as the year has gone on and they've become more comfortable. Um, you can see quotes there from some of our teachers that have really um, just, it's been so positive with open court overall. It was really one of those that the teachers asked for this. Um, and then the quote, my favorite, is a first grade student at Timbergrove. After an open court lesson was over, he exclaimed, learning to read is so much fun. Um, and that's really what learning is all about, is that engagement for students. Next card, please. So I love that. I can't not smile every time I hear that um, because learning to read should be so much fun. And that's what we really endeavor to do in each of our classrooms every day. Uh, so we can't have a Dibbles presentation without talking about a multi-tiered system of support. Um, and so although I know we've um, used this graphic before, I think it's always important to understand how do all these pieces come together? And so on our tier one base, um, of course, we have the Open Court Reading Foundational Skills curriculum, which is instrumental um, in ensuring that all students are taught to read using the science of reading. Um, we also are training so many teachers every year using the letters professional development. And so if there were gaps in their pre-service training before they became a teacher, they are also learning how to teach reading explicitly based on the science of reading. And so that is our our base um, before we go anywhere else. And along the side of the triangle for foundational reading skills, you'll see Dibbles. And this is where it really fits in, is that it is really trying to tell us, do we have students that need more intense support? And if we um, see there is an indicator that there is a symptom, uh, like Dr. Wolf explained, we will look at some other ways to um, analyze what the specific issues are. But um, you can see we do have some tier two and tier three interventions to help if students it's not enough just getting the tier one open court um, curriculum. And so uh, we have the open court teacher resource book. We have SIPs um, that we were able to purchase for every single school this year. Um, and there's Hegarty phonemic awareness for our tier two. And then for tier three, we have Orton Gillingham and foundations. And so all of these pieces together will help ensure that we are giving students what they need at the point of need. And so it's important to remember that if we have something that we've put into place that we are using an evidence-based approach um, to teaching students how to read. Next slide, please. So at this point, we would like to open up for any questions or clarifications. Thank you. I want to thank um, both of you for the presentation. And if staff has nothing else to say because Ms. Mack was the one who had the foresight to ask for this. I'm 
would like to start with Ms. Mack and then we can come back with other members who have questions. Ms. Mack, because I think I know you this well, after you've asked your second question, uh, if there's someone else who wants to jump in, I'd appreciate it if we could bring that person in and then we'll come here's, back. To here's my questions, Ms. Pasteur. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah. I'll be quick. Um, I know that we have a count of the number of teachers in grades K through three. Do we have a count of the number of teachers trained on open court letters in Orton Gillingham? So Ms. Mack, this is Ms. Shea. I'm going to go first and then I'll let my team um, jump in. We actually were having a conversation really recently about aligning it by school. So um, we definitely have a count of the number of people who have um, been trained in letters. The challenge that we would have right this instant is sorting them by what position they hold, because mm -hmm. of course we open the training for reading specialists and special educators. So we actually just recently had a conversation prompted by some of the questions that you have asked us about how do we know in which school um, especially with all the staff turnover that some schools have more than others, um, what that looks like. The open court training is also a little bit challenging because of the way we had to shift last spring. Uh, we typically are able to give much more uh, consistent data about who's been trained and where because we use our registration system mm -hmm. and we run reports when teachers register for professional learning. Two things have happened in the last year that made that less accurate and a little more challenging. One is that last spring we had to cancel our face to face trainings for many of our teachers. We did shift to offering training through um, self paced modules that we put in Schoology and that's just much harder for us to track in terms of um, participation. The second thing that of course you know we've experienced the ransomware attack which impl um, impacted the registration system so we lost some of that historical information. So um, the, the reality is it's definitely something that we have to keep working on. We have, as I mentioned, aggregate numbers. Um, and then the third one you asked about was Orton Gillingham, same thing. We do have aggregate numbers that have been trained over time. I know that the Office of Special Education um, does track by schools because again our goal for both letters and Orton Gillingham is to have folks in every school have that training. Um, what I can't speak to right this minute um, but certainly will welcome anyone else on my team to join in is of course we know staff moves, staff uh, transfer, staff work in different so oftentimes our data indicates where they were working when they attended the training. Um, so that would be another um, challenge. What we had been working on prior to the ransomware attack um, with in collaboration with the Office of Special Education um, and we were just talking about this in one of our meetings recently mm -hmm. um, was ways that we could better use our registration system to help us track some of the accountability pieces that go with training and so for example uh, what we were really leaning in on was many of our trainings for example require multiple parts um, we've struggled, to be honest with you, if you're trying to do a paper pencil with a system as large as ours to make sure that if Miss Mac attended session one and session two, that she came for the follow up in session three or vice versa, that Miss Pasteur can't register for session three if she didn't attend session one and session two. Um, for a number of years, that's been challenging because it's been largely a manual process um, and trying to go through. So um, before, I guess it was last fall, we had two meetings with the staff in um, organizational effectiveness that help us with registration for ongoing professional learning and we were working together to see if there's a way that we could adapt the registration system to help us have that information so that we could run reports at the school level who's been trained in what how do we make sure that we're following up on that accountability to complete it um, of course we lost that whole system and the ransomware but the good news is as we're looking for and I know the team is in lots of conversations in organizational effectiveness about what's going to replace that system. Um, and that will be an additional ask of ours is how do we then use it to help leverage some of our um, accountability around training? So I don't know if anyone on my team has anything they want to add to that. Ms. Shea, can I um, just follow up on what you sure. said? Please? Yeah, I guess my concern is what we hear all the time on the. Well, first of all, I want to say this. I have heard great things about Dibbles. I have heard wonderful, wonderful things about open court, Orton Gillingham letters. I never hear teachers complain, so that is wonderful. That's and great. I appreciate Dr. McComas <laughs> and Ms. Pasteur bringing this presentation forward today. But my concern is this, 
we always hear in curriculum committee that our general education teachers have the skills, have the training to meet the vast majority of needs of children who need interventions. But when you just answered the question, you answered the question talking about um, reading specialists and special educators. Um, you said we look at our reading specialists and special educators. No, I'm but sorry. Ms. Mack, what I said is that we train teachers, but we can't necessarily say that my numbers, if I tell you that I've trained, you asked me, how will I know how many teachers at each school are been trained? And what I was sharing is that I'll have data that says a thousand, you know, 1200 individuals were trained and that includes teachers and reading specialists. And specialists. So I just want to clarify. Okay, you thank you. But I, thank yeah. you. I guess my concern is this. What if, you know, I have a school in my district that has a huge turnover, right? So what if one year 27 teachers were new what if none of those teachers had been trained in yep. any of this stuff but yet i know that that school has great needs how are sure. their needs being met so there's a couple ways so first i want to offer that's a very real challenge and and so there's a couple things that we do in the short term we do have some schools where we train the whole staff we have worked and um, dr wolf might think of an example um, or two in, in a moment but we have worked in collaboration with some principals who say i can't afford this because one of the other challenges and i know we've talked about this before i also can't pull 27 teachers out of that building right to do this training because that's not going to work for students and families either so we have on occasion in schools that have a high number of new teachers or high turnover rate um, done a school specific letters training where we do Saturdays and teachers come and we pay them and we pay for the trainer out of our office. We've trained a lot of team members in our office to do it. That's one way that we have addressed a very um, specific need in some of our schools that either have a high population of teachers um, turning over every year because we often know that that happens in our schools that have the greatest needs. So then we have that um, double whammy. The other thing long term, um, we have talked about and try now to add some of it. Um, Dr. Wolf mentioned the new teacher orientation and some of that ongoing. We would really like for some of the basic letters to be a mandatory part of new teacher training so that we can actually do it as part of that summer. Um, we had been working with um, Billy Burke. Um, again, a lot of this, and I'm just being very honest, some of the work that was more uh, future oriented and vision setting has been paused as we've been working through the last um, 14 months in the pandemic. But that was a project that we had started of how could we sort of play Red Rover and have a line that say, if you're coming to work in our school system, we're adding this piece. And then the third piece is we do partner to try to push on the university systems. We need to change the teacher preparation programs because without that, we are constantly playing catch up with our teachers. So it's Ms. not a Ms. quick Shannon, fix, but yes, go ahead. If I just may um, interject there for a moment. Now, wait, and, but after you interject, Dr. McComas, I want to interject on this piece as well. Yes. Go ahead. Yes, yes ma'am. And uh, and forgive me if I'm usurping uh, your point, perhaps. Um, I think, Ms. Mack, I just wanted to piggyback on Ms. Shea's point around helping our university partners incorporate uh, this type of training in in the credentialing process for our, our, our people who are in teacher training programs. Um, but much of that also is anchored in the need for legislation to require that as part of the teacher training process. We saw in the Ready to Read Act, the power of how legislation can help. Um, and I think that quite frankly, the letters training um, and some of the points that Mr. Shea was talking about, um, our universities move to as there's um, legislation that also and requires that as part of preparation. So that's all I want to add. And I hope I didn't steal your thunder, Ms. 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 Pesture, on the legislative oh, committees. Thank you. No, 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 not at all. Um, in fact, I'm going back to the discussion that Ms. Mack and uh, Ms. Shea just had. Um, at the, the presentation, and again, thank you very much. Um, it's been wonderful, but I always listen to, to the verbiage, so I know whether we're talking past tense, present tense, or future tense. And I heard all of the things that we'd like to do and we are starting to do and that we've done. Um, the pandemic has been about one year and then some. So my question to all of you um, is, what do you see as the problem 
because these numbers that we're seeing for our students didn't just happen. And as board members, possibly we need to be leaned on, not in a negative way, but to offer the verbiage, the solutions to help with the offices, with staff, because this really is unacceptable at this point. We have all of these wonderful things happening, but again, we know I love context. So in a quick New York second, if we don't process um, why in the past, this is one time when you have to look backwards and figure out, and if it is about people moving around, what's the problem? Because in some of our schools, we have seen the numbers looking the same for our children year after year, decade after decade, and it's truly unacceptable. So with all of these things that are wonderful, I want to know what we've been doing in the process, processing, so that at this very point, it's not just about looking at past numbers, it's not just about listening to a presentation, but whether we're coming out, of, we hope, of a pandemic and going into something else, what is going to be different? Because these numbers have to change our realities for our children and our futures have to change. Help me understand what it is we can do to support you so we can make these changes. This is, it's all on, the numbers are unacceptable year after year to me. So thank, uh, yeah, so thank you, Ms. Pasture. Um, so I do wanna start with some anecdotal data um, that we didn't put in the slide, but I wanna start there, which is we decided um, as a team to look at our pilot schools. So our schools that had been doing it for um, three years now, and what we were able to see in those specific schools um, was their Dibbles data was really strong. And so what that's telling me is this open court implementation is being successful, right? But we need time for it. This is the first year that it was in second and third grade, right? Um, we also need fidelity of implementation. So we need to make sure we've, we're doing the trainings, but then it has to be done um, in the right way in so that schools are implementing the way that it was designed. Um, and so we have lots of things that we do, including our residency model to help partner with schools. Um, and also um, this spring, we are planning to uh, work with all the principals to say what should open court look like? How should it be scheduled? What should you see? Because leadership is a huge piece of making sure that all of these pieces come together. And so um, it takes time. It, so the data is not going to magically look better, but what we were able to see in the, the pilot schools that we identified is that it is looking better. And so as we continue down this path, we're going to see that trajectory change. But there are a lot of things that need to happen, um, including, you know, co-planning and professional learning communities um, and, you know, looking at student work and, you know, diagnosis and correct placement into interventions when students need the interventions. And so we're really coming at it at a multi-pronged approach to say that there's not one thing, but we know that we've picked the right things and that we are sh we are really confident in the fact that we're going to start to see those numbers move. Um, but there is going to be some time. And then, like you said, we threw a pandemic in the middle of our implementation, right? Like we started to see some really good traction and then like, bam, pandemic, but it didn't stop us. We still had the trainings. We still, you know, and we've learned some things. So like, I know um, Ms. Mack asked about the letters training. So we've always done it during, or most of the time done it during the day, right? But because of the pandemic, we've, we now have an after school cohort and we've had some people say, this is really good. We've actually had some Saturday cohorts. And so we've really, so I always like to say, well, what has the pandemic allowed us to figure out creatively that we can carry on after um, it's over, right? So we have learned some really creative things that I think will help us moving forward um, so that we can start to see those numbers change because that is what we all want and that's what our students deserve. And so we are committed to doing that and looking at it from multiple angles. Okay, Ms. Pastor, I know that um, mm -hmm. Dr. Hager had a question too, but I just want to add, Ms. Pastor, to your question. You're 
around what can the board do to help us, right? Because we all agree the data is unacceptable and it's far past time for us to move it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when and I one, I want to say thank you for that question, right? Because mm -hmm. we know that we no, cannot that, do this actually, alone. That without. wasn't a question. That but, was that was an indictment for all of us because I started teaching in 1971 and some of you weren't born. And we've been looking <laughs> at this and people were saying we have to wait. Just keep waiting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we right. keep reducing year after year after year, children who are who are caught in mm -hmm. that whole notion of weight mm -hmm. and that right. has to right. stop. So go yeah. ahead, Dr. McCormick. And then yes, Dr. yes ma'am, yes ma'am. And um, I am right there with you that um, time is of the essence. Um, I would say that, you know, your question around how can the board support this work, right? The the board is always, your, your areas of work are policy and budget, you know, and you have been mm -hmm. helping us, right? You have helped us bring in open court. You ha are working with us around um, the math program, I know that's a side, but I just wanted to bring it back to say uh, that, you know, the board functions around policy and budget, and I, I believe you have been supporting us um, and will continue to support us in both of those realms as we continue to move forward. You know, again, the policy perhaps relates to professional learning. I know that's something that we come back to and discuss often. I would also say that we are making great strides um, with the implementation of open court um, and of course in a parallel as we move into bridges um, with um, implementing programs with greater fidelity, right? So that we can yield the outcomes for our students that we know these uh, research-based and highly rated programs are capable of supporting us in. So I will just add that and um, on that, I want to just do okay. a time check. It is 341. Okay. So All right. Thank but this is important, and, and I'm going to say this to the board members then. So three of the four, three of us on this committee were also on the goals committee. And we have goals that are addressing what we want to see and review. Um, and two of us are on the budget committee, the new budget committee. And that means, like you said, money has to be put into things. We need to see uh, the broader picture. That means it needs to be articulated. It needs to be articulated in, in real numbers, not just things that we throw out, but that you throw at us. So we are accurate in what we're doing. And it does go beyond just approving a program. OK, because a program is just a program is a program. And clearly it means nothing if we are not reaching the children and the staff. Dr. Hager. Um, no, I'm so excited about this conversation. And I, I honestly think this is how we should end every presentation is thinking about what we can do for you to help this move forward. Um, and so I, I wrote down that, you know, I heard a lot of ideas, but more professional development time sounded like something that is needed. You know, we also approve the yes. calendar. That's another yes. thing that the board does. Um, certainly with the budget, is it reading specialists that you would need to um, help support this? Or because um, it sounds like classroom teachers do a lot of the evaluation. Is that correct? Yes, so definitely professional learning, because as I mentioned, a real struggle is competing interest. Telling a family that I'm pulling their first grade teacher out is not going well. Schools can't find substitutes, so having protected time, because mm -hmm. then we can mandate and we can require, and so that would be really beneficial. Um, we are fortunate that we do in our system, and not a lot of systems do, so we have to give ourselves that credit. We have a reading specialist in every school, and in some schools, we've used some of the Kerwin funding to fund a second one in some of our largest schools. Um, I'm sure there's many other schools under that next threshold that would love a second one, so certainly moving forward, having one specifically to have that early childhood or primary focus so that we can really flood those resources. And the third thing I would add, it does matter when you visit schools and when you ask about open court implementation and when you ask about letters training and teachers and administrators see that that has value in our system because sometimes what gets talked about and what gets measured is what's valued. And so even just that's why we are really grateful when we have this time to talk about it on camera, live streamed and to have board members asking that really does carry a lot of weight. When Ms. Mack and Dr. Hager, Ms. Pester, Mr. Offerman, when you go in classrooms and say, 
Tell me about open court implementation. Tell me about how you're using what you learned in letters training. That means a lot to teachers and to administrators um, and then can feed an interest. I will tell you more than once after one of you has visited a school, I've gotten an email from a principal or teacher saying, hey, did I miss the sign up for that? Or can my teacher have that opportunity? It really does um, mean a lot to us. And then I think having conversations like this, so we hold ourselves accountable to following up on that data, because as Dr. McComas said, when she, you know, I heard the mom in her, she's like, we got to move. Um, we, we all share that. We do share that sense of urgency, but we also don't want it to come as a hammer. Data needs to be a flashlight so that we can really um, not use it as a hammer because teachers have a lot on their plate and, 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 and families are doing their best, but rather using it as a flashlight to say, and we need to do better because we can't stay here. So those are all the ways that I would say. Um, and again, I thank you for the question too, because it does mean a lot to us and the time. You know, there are some districts that pause rollouts of implementation because of the pandemic and we did not we forged ahead with open court in second and third grade and overhauling our primary math so our primary teachers in a pandemic learned both a new math and a new phonics because we couldn't afford to wait because we do mm -hmm. have that sense of urgency and that's a big deal and I think it's important that we recognize that because there are plenty of districts that said oh we had plans and we paused them because of everything else we were handling and that took a huge commitment from my team Dr. Wolf and Ms. Kraft and all of our resource teachers but also our principals and our teachers um, to do that in spite of everything else that they were doing. So thank you. Thank you. And as we move to the next thing, know that I'm looking for a professional development calendar because yes. folks, if things are laid out and people know when things are coming um, and I've been looking for it for a long time, it must be invisible. But I'm going to see a professional <laughs> development calendar. And Ms. Mack, did you get this book yet? I'm telling you, you're right. It's not just about the numbers, context, how we make. I have not. Okay, oh. let's get it driven by data. But I want to see that professional development calendar. So Ms. Dr. McCombs, let's move I, on. I have it on my list. I have that. And Ms. Pasture, if you could send me the name of that book, I'll make sure our committee members get a copy of it. So. I'm going to send it to you and I'm going to okay. show. Make Pasture, of can I just um, encourage everybody to read the email that I sent last night because it talks about a lot about what we talked about today. Mm -hmm. And I probably veered off into operations making some suggestions about how we can accomplish some of our challenges. Um, but I, I, I don't like we said, we can't we can't wait. Um, Agreed. Can I ask a quick question about how we notify parents though? How are parents notified about their kids scores and how do we incorporate parents in our solution? Um, I'll start and then welcome um, Dr. Wolf or Ms. Kraft um, because actually this is really timely. The expectation uh, with reading specialists is that families are supposed to be notified of their child's DIBL score along with that context. Um, I shared the word expectation because we have learned of instances where that did not take place. That came up as part of our CCAT conversation. So um, that's always a part of ongoing communication and, and Dr. Wolf can certainly speak to that as well. Um, and then how can families participate? Um, we do work with family and community engagement, the incredible Sue Han, to offer um, literacy workshops, beginning reader workshops um, for families. Um, we do also provide um, lots of different suggestions for resources for how families can help um, because so much of this early literacy can be done through really um, positive and fun ways with families together. Um, I don't know, Dr. Wolf or Ms. Kraft, is there anything you want to add? I know we're short on time, but I wanted to at least give you those pieces. Thank you. Sure. I, I know one thing that I'm going to add is that we did create um, a course for Parent University um, to explain more about uh, reading, the science of reading, um, the different interventions we offer. And so we have partnered with Parent University um, as one avenue to be able to support parents in understanding um, all the different pieces of reading. So that's that rolled out this spring. Thank you. All right, um, Dr. McComas, you and I, Wetton, and Mr. Um, Offerman, as we're planning for the future, we're going to have 
a meeting where we're going to talk about that question because I have that question still with the three D's and and the answer we got back about that Ms. M Ms. Mack and I both asked about numbers and I understand the federal and all of that. Um, but we need to have some discussion about how as a board we can support making sure parents know what's going on, particularly with curriculum and instruction, because that is a problem, not just for this, but across the board. So how does um, about 11 minutes look? Is that going to work, <laughs> Ms. Shea? Well, um, how could we start and then we can always pause and pick it back up at the next one? What do you think, Dr. Sure McComas? Can. That works for me. What do you think, Dr. McComas? That, that is fine by me. At least we can give you a little teaser around uh, our, our writing presentation. Uh, consider this a preview uh, to next month's uh, opportunity. So go ahead. And uh, let's go ahead and jump in and make the most of it. Wonderful. And I just wanted to say thank you, Mr. Corns. I saw that you know our equity committee will start at four. So for those of us who participate in that opportunity as well, I just want to be mindful. So. OK, so Mr. Corns, can you um, shift to the writing present things? Thank you. And I'm going to go really quickly through. You can go to the next slide really quickly. Um, and we're going to be in this presentation. We're going to begin to talk about our comprehensive literacy. This started from a question. I believe it was Mr. Kuhn back in the fall that first asked about it. And so what we're doing today, we're going to begin doing and then we'll pick up next time is talk about the elements of effective writing instruction. What is our writing curriculum? What does BCPS do to teach writing? I believe that there are also questions about writing intervention. But if you think about that tiered triangle, tonight's presentation that will start to and pick up is really about tier one. Um, this is about our um, writing curriculum that is part of our core for pre-K to 12. Next slide, please. I'm going to quickly talk about where this fits in with our strategic plan. I know Ms. Pasteur referenced the board goals, which also stem from our systems strategic plan that Dr. Williams put together. They, um, everything we're going to talk about tonight is aligned to that first goal area of learning accountability and results. Next slide. Two areas of learning accountability and results that our writing curriculum aligns with is the teaching and learning framework and disciplinary literacy. Next slide. So in the teaching and learning framework, as you know, and we could do a whole nother presentation on the teaching and learning framework itself, which I would love, um, really outlines the core beliefs. What do we believe about teaching and learning in BCPS and what do we expect? I know we've talked about it in um, overview terms, but we could spend a lot of time on that. Here, what we've done is pulled out some of the expectations aligned to each of those core learning beliefs in the teaching and learning framework that really support our vision for writing curriculum. So you'll see opportunities for teachers um, providing multiple and flexible ways of presenting information to students and helping them acquire and demonstrate learning. Um, writing is often the way that we demonstrate what we've understood from reading, from content areas, even in mathematics. You'll see in some of our core beliefs, we talk about voice and choice and engaging students, setting high expectations and providing routine, timely and specific feedback. All of that is captured in our approach to the writing curriculum in BCPS. Next slide. And then also in the strategic plan, um, in addition to the core learning beliefs as captured in the teaching and learning framework in that focus area one, we also have the area of disciplinary literacy. So this uh, committee knows how strongly all of us feel about the development of literacy and authentic literacy, um, that it's the foundation of learning, but it's also the way that our students demonstrate their understanding. And so we are going to continue to um, talk about how writing across content areas plays a role in that. And I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Kraft, I believe. All right, so on the screen, you're going to see our definition of literacy. Uh, literacy interweaves reading, writing, listening, speaking. However, today we are going to focus on the writing portion of literacy. And writing is a key means of asserting and defending claims, showing what students have learned, um, what they um, have experienced, imagined, thought, felt. And so to be college and career ready writers, students must take task, purpose, audience, 
and really put them all together after careful consideration to choose words, information, the structures, and their formats deliberately. They need to know how to combine elements of different types of writing. For example, to use narrative strategies with an argument, an explanation with a narrative, to produce complex and nuanced writing. They need to be able to use technology strategically when creating, refining, and collaborating on writing. They have to become adept at gathering information, evaluating sources, citing materials accurately, reporting findings from their research and analysis of sources in a clear manner. They must have the flexibility, concentration, and fluency to produce high quality first draft text under a tight deadline, as well as the capacity to revisit and make improvements to a piece of writing over time. Next slide, please. So based on that, you're going to see what we believe that students deserve to be explicitly taught how to write. The Maryland College and Career Readiness Standards for writing move away from the formulaic writing expected under earlier state standards. Um, think all the way back to the Maryland Functional Writing Test, right? Um, now the standards um, are really designed to produce rich writers that can be fluid um, across multiple types of writing. And so let's take a look at the anchor standards for writing. Next slide, please. So the Maryland College and Career Anchor Writing Standards assure that students are able to write in varied ways for varied purposes and audiences, produce clear and coherent writing with appropriate idea development, organization, and style, and become adept at research using print and internet search, uh, sources. So in the first band, um, the standards for text types and purposes, which are anchor standards one, two, and three, um, they address the types of writing that students should be engaged in. So argument, informative, explanatory, and narrative, as well as the purposes for which they write, which is to argue or persuade, to inform or explain, or to convey experience. Many of the skills that students need to develop are transferable among text types and purposes. The Maryland College and Career Readiness Standards helps develop students who write for different types of purposes and audiences. Writing for different purposes and audiences stimulates different kinds of thinking, logical, exploratory, aesthetic, and expressive. Mastering all of those kinds of thinking lead to well-rounded individuals. The next band of writing um, that you'll see is the production and distribution of writing, and those are anchor standards four, five, and six. The Maryland College and Career Ready Standards for Production and Distribution of Writing address the components of well-written work, development, organization, style, the process of creating high-quality work, so planning, revising, editing, and utilizing technology to publish writing. The next band of writing is research to build and present knowledge, and those are going to be anchor standards seven, eight, and nine. And it's really never been more important than the present for students to learn to assess the credibility and accuracy of each electronic source of information without plagiarizing before integrating it into their writing. The Maryland College and Career Readiness Writing Standards for Research to Build and Present Knowledge address the need for students to make their research accurate and include varied sources. And the last, um, I guess it's not a band because it's only one, um, is Anchor Standard 10, and that really has to do with the range of writing. Standard 10 urges a range of types of writing, which expands thinking and learning by avoiding a strict pattern of writing or on thoughts. Success in the real world depends on the ability of students to write flexibly. Workplace functions include completing a job application, writing a memo, composing a letter. College expectations include writing short responses, longer responses, and more sustained projects, papers and reports in various genres, including creative writing, literary analysis, scientific or historical reports and summaries. Writing, depending on what the situation calls for, is an essential aspect of college and career readiness. Next slide, please. So Ms. Kratt, I, or, I'm sorry to interrupt. I do think yes. we need to pause. I think oh, okay, we have, um, sorry. That's that's okay. I'm truly sorry to cut us off because I felt like we were just beginning to sink in. Um, I think this may be an appropriate place for us to pause. I think we have one question perhaps we can try to answer before we have to conclude only because the equity committee uh, begins at four and um, that's the majority of this committee 
as well. So <laughs> yeah, um, so Mr. Mahomes can ask his question and then we will adjourn. Thank you, Dr. Mahomes. Thank you, ladies, so much. Mr. Yeah, yeah, and I hope and I hate to ask a question in the middle of your presentation because uh, you might be addressing this later on, but I was curious to know um, uh, many this is really known in colleges. They have like um, writing centers and um, those centers have um, online writing resources where students can um, go on there anytime, um, whether they're writing essays or um, uh, proofreading their drafts. And I was wondering, um, does such a thing exist on, on a county level or at least in a school level? Um, online resources where students can access anytime? Um, So Mr. Mahamza, this is Ms. Shea. I'm going to try to give a 30 second start and then when we come back next month to finish, we can talk more about it. One of the things that we're going to share that exists in Houghton Mifflin Collections is a virtual somewhat writing center that includes mm -hmm. modules that have um, support resources for students, ways for them to get feedback on their drafts, um, links to video resources and step by step um, sample lessons. Um, it's an underutilized awesome resource that really does function very similarly. It doesn't have that live support that happens a lot of times in universities. Uh, we don't have something at the system level like that, which would be amazing, um, but it does have some of the um, module resources for students to work through writing, get that kind of feedback, see different sample responses, sample rubrics, error correction, and things of that nature. So that's one piece of what I think you're describing. OK, yeah. thank you, um, Ms. Shea. We are, uh, can I get a motion now? I know Ms. Mack, you were typing, but if you can hold, if you had a question, if you can hold that, we are now at four o'clock. Uh, I'd like a motion to adjourn, please. So moved, Mac. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Second. Offerman. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Thank you, everyone, for the presentation and board members for your wonderful questions and participation. Have a good afternoon. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you.